Hare Krishna Hanuvat Prashak Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you very much for joining for the Monks podcast today. It has been a long cherished desire to have your association individually as well uh -huh. as to share it with others. When you had come uh -huh. to GEV and we had met, I could say that was one of the most mm. uh, inspiring intellectual and spiritual discussions that I've ever had with anyone. So I pray <laughs> for it. <laughs> I don't know whether I have uh, like lovelier for Krishna, but I do have lovelier greed for association like you provide. So I'm uh -huh. very immensely grateful, Maharaj. Sri Prabhupada said that too much devotion is a symptom of a thief. <laughs> well, I'm happy yeah. to be called a thief if that helps me get your association. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Maharaj. So, when when I have heard, I, I've been following you on your blogs and I have heard some of your classes. You know, what I am I'm amazed by is the, the intellectual width as well as the depth of what are the topics that you discuss. Ah. So, so, since you mentioned today, I thought we could discuss about uh, Western literature, maybe the foundation of Western literature, one of the founding figures of Western literature, we could say, one of the primary, primary mm. authors is Shakespeare. So, how oh. somebody sees Shakespeare from a spiritual or a devotional perspective? Um. Well, there's a, well, let's see, where to start? You know, you know, for, for us, you know, books are the basis. Yes. Um, when, when Prabhupada came to San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, in 1975, I think it was, 75, we just moved from the temple in San Francisco, which had been a mortuary, <laughs> 455 oh. Valencia Street. And we moved to San Francisco, and it was uh, Berkeley. It was a uh, six six city lots. It was a big, uh, you know, big building. Public pleased. And I remember, I, you know, I, I personally heard from the, from the lips of my spiritual master. You know, there were maybe five uh, reporters there from big media, and one of them asked, "Swamiji, what will happen to your movement when you die?" You know, and probably, and now you're hearing from my lips. <laughs> So Prabhupada said very, you know, firmly, he said, I will never die. I will live forever in my books. Okay. And so then we have complete access to Prabhupada, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, of, of all this, of course, we have a separate little program called the Bhakti Vedanta Library, where, where we're, you know, sorting Prabhupada's books systematically and looking at the, in, in their relationship. But uh, Prabhupada says in the preface to uh, nectar of instruction that Upade Upadesham Rita constitutes first instructions for neophyte devotees. And we find it that way, such a wonderful base from our side, you know, from our literature. And in there, Prabhupada says, he quotes, Maya tatam midam sarvam jagata vyakta murtena mastani sarvabhutani nachaham teshvavasitaha. And he uses it to uh, to illustrate the point that everything is Krishna's energy. He talks about using a, a microphone, a dictaphone, you know. So yeah, and he says that devotees they understand the way to use everything in Krishna's service, you know. So from that perspective, then of course some of us like books, somebody else likes painting, somebody else likes gardening, you know, somebody else likes war. So fighting you know. yeah so every everything can be used in krishna's service so i would say from that you know very broad perspective okay then utilizing uh different literature you know of course we approach it as you know world classical literature world classical literature okay and within that of course we have the the european you know traditions uh english language traditions hmm. and and then these influence people. You know, this is how people identify. Who are we? You know, by their uh, their literary traditions, literary traditions. Uh, I just one in, minute, if you don't. Mind. No, no, go ahead. No. So, <laughs> in general, the principle of yukta vairagya of using everything in Krishna's service that is quite foundational for our movement spread and outreach. Mm -hmm. But somehow. When we bring it to books and thoughts and worldviews, there is a certain amount of hesitation or even aversion 
because say yeah. generally if somebody is going to use <laughs> say somebody is going to use a computer or a phone yeah those can distract us but they don't seem directly to be competitors to our devotion whereas when we say like recently i have started a, a, a group for encouraging devotees to write and i uh-huh. quote from various contemporary authors about how to write well and how to get the motivation to write so one devotee asked a question over there that i already don't have time to read prabhupad's books enough and how will i how should i get, should i make how can i make time for reading other books on writing so then the answer i gave at that time is you know, if you see writing as a service What's then then well, that, let, let, sorry just let me complete this so that, sorry the writing sure. as a service then that is service time that is not uh, that is not your sadhana time if you are building a temple for krishna if you are learning to cook for krishna you may want to read some books for doing it better and you wouldn't put that time for those books in competition with your your spiritual books so that idea of yukta vairagya that we can apply it even in the intellectual domain to engage with books and ideas and world views somehow that is not so that is not so widespread or not so accepted have you also observed something like that maharaj oh well, yeah very much and and i would say it's because you know most people are not inclined towards books <laughs> most people are not literary they don't look at look at them that way you know uh what to, what can you say is that um it's just a fact even 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 in in ordinary any any ordinary culture people who were who sometimes you know what is it when the russians russians were conquering places they would take anybody who had glasses and kill them yep <laughs> because because that means they could read you know okay in the same way proper the books are the basis you know um mm-hmm. what bhakti vino takur for example we know him right you know there's a very famous uh document where uh he describes how we should what what, what mentality what attitude what bhava what consciousness we should have when we are in other people's uh place of worship at the time of worship you yeah, know that very beautiful quote yeah be yeah, in a so respectful mood and see yeah. that god is manifesting in a different way from what i know but yeah 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 the same god i i'm worshiping is being worshiped here he says and i can uh therefore i can you know steal you know <laughs> a few a few things from this process to to enhance my my own process of worshiping my deities you know uh but because does i don't he, does belong he talk about to, does he talk about stealing or that's no i i i i i think he says just take some things <laughs> okay yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah okay yeah mm-hmm. and it's a fact you know i mean proper at the sunday feast there's no sunday feast in indian tradition you know yeah and then um he goes on to say that bhakti vinod thakur says but because i don't belong to this specific tradition i won't be participating in the details of the worship you know so mm-hmm. same way yeah we we adopt certain things we can take and if lord chaitanya specifically uh he 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 took sanyas in a mayavadi sampradaya right to be able to establish his his people appreciate his position to communicate and then he sat there you know he had to have he had to have known something of shankar's philosophy to be able to to communicate with them you know his ideas and so on you know yeah mm. and so for for both reasons to to build bridges so that we can take advantage of the, the different uh, resources and then and then they can take advantage of our resources and in that way we can build a, a strong world you know to uh, to 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 combat the basic principles of illusion Okay. Yeah. Can you just repeat the two purposes, Maharaj? To build bridges and to yeah, if we yeah, if we build, for example, we're we're especially focusing on Carl Jung a lot, but let's look at Socrates. I mean, uh, Shakespeare. You know, um, Han, I had so much association with Hans Duda. He went. He was our zonal acharya during the you know the, the Guru era, and a lot very nice in many ways, very nice. You know, but I think it was he he said that Prabhupada said. uh you can teach shakespeare in the gurukula you know oh. and if, and if you want to understand word power uh, uh then you should read shakespeare you know 
Yeah. And uh, I've, I've seen that. I mean, uh, he, was, he was like an empowered person. There's other discussions about this, but it, it seems that he was being empowered by some Gandharva or something, you know. But his, even still, the potency of his words is so powerful that, that, that it communicates very deeply to people. And it's not only just, just the words, because he has formed our perspective on certain psycho- iconographic issues. You know, uh, oh, okay. for example, you've heard of the movie, the movie, The Lion King, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, by Walt Disney. The, mm-hmm. the original investment was was like forty five million dollars to make the movie. You know? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how much is, is made since it was how much money is made since it was first produced? No idea. Much more than that. Four hundred and ninety million dollars. Profit have been made so far, and it's still going. And from the very beginning, there's just no bones about it. They just say it. It, it, it is based upon Hamlet. It's based upon Hamlet. The, the 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 evil uncle kills the father. The young prince has to fight. So it's the same iconographic, you know, the same bhava mm-hmm. is being presented, and it's a big part then of our our whole Western ethos of who we are, you know. What to speak of the the, 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 the contemplations, the introspection. So that, that's what I would say is that it's an opportunity for us who are born in a certain culture to be able to take the Vedic perspective into our, our heart. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, I understand that. Yeah, I know that. I, I grew up with that, you know. And then also to find the language to be able to express it from the other side, you know. Mm, yeah, yes. I can go on forever here. <laughs> so just yeah. to rearticulate the two points you mentioned, first is that that we can get we can build bridges by getting the language to communicate, as well as the way what is influencing people today. We yeah. can we can l- connect that with Krishna. So it's both to reach them and to help them to reach some reach Krishna's wisdom in some way, both ways. Yeah, it's the same. Uh, dealing with this, for example, what is the most famous phrase in Hamlet? What is the most famous question in the world? To do in the whole not world. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. To be. Okay, so we see Arjuna at the mm-hmm. battlefield of Kurukshetra. And he's sitting there looking at the Kauravas, looking at Bhishma and, and Drona and wondering, you know, to be or not to be. That is the question. To take arms against the sea of Kauravas, to fight, perchance to die, to dream. Ah, but there's the problem. <laughs> For who knows what dreams will come after we have shuffled off this mortal coil. I would count myself king of infinite space, bound up in a nutshell, if only I did not have bad dreams. <laughs> so you see... <laughs> You're you're coming out of it, but you, you've been influenced by this, you know, by the same same culture. Mm-hmm. So so it's like I never, like, so yeah. I never heard Gita being presented in Shakespearean language. It's quite a yeah. transporting experience just to hear a few thoughts presented like that. I mean, it's tough. You know, we we started developing this. We have a you know a program. I, I, I sent you the PowerPoint show we were using. Yeah. And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe, what is it, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And uh, there's two major themes in Hamlet, you know, that, that one drama. It's, people say that amongst all the works of Shakespeare, Hamlet is like the, the Himal- is like, you say this, Hamlet is like, like the Mount Everest amongst the Himalaya mountains. There's oh, also okay. King, King Lear, there's uh, Macbeth, and they're all very intense. There's the Taming of the Shrew, they're all very appropriate for Western or even like, you know, educated Indian audiences who are international, who, who actually people who grew up with the influence of the British Raja. Yeah. 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 You say, oh, now I understand our heritage. Now I understand how we got this. Now I understand, sir, why we are speaking British English, sir. Sir, I am speaking British English. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a, That's I mean, interesting. You know, I was preparing for this talk. I was looking at the influence of Hamlet or Shakespeare's work in general in India. So it seems in the ah. pre-independence and post-independence times, 
there were quite a few movie renditions of Shakespeare's work. Even Hamlet has oh. been rendered in Hindi, but oh. nothing in the last few decades. Not so much. Yeah. Nothing yeah. became so much popular. So it seems that uh, maybe as the world changed, but even in the Western world, I would say that in humanities, is Shakespeare the, that much of an influence now? Because it's more of critical the- critical analysis and uh, hey, hey, Baba, deconstructionist. <laughs> no, deconstruct. How many Indians have watched The Lion King? Oh, okay. But hardly anyone <laughs> knows that Lion King is actually derived from Hamlet. <laughs> the, yeah. the poison works no matter how you get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's the same story of young men. Okay, you know, I've got to fight my evil uncle, protect my father, whatever it is. Mm. You know, marry the pretty girl. Yeah. yeah. So, Maharaj, you mentioned earlier that uh, you know those who have already familiar with Shakespeare, then if they can see it from a more spiritual perspective, it builds bridges. So mm-hmm. can you tell something about your journey? Where you also like your journey, where you also avid reader of Shakespeare before you introduced to Krishna consciousness? And did you make a conscious decision to revisit those literature at a particular time um, in your life as a, as a, as a sannyasi, as a devotee? Um, I was growing up, <laughs> like most of us, you know, I had a tail, you know, like that, whatever. Um, and, and, and when you go to school, they make you read, you know, okay, gosh, you know. Anyway, I was doing it, okay, you know, it was boring. But then I discovered, uh, you know, juvenile literature, you know, children's, children's books in my, our local library, which was a really good library, you know, big library. And, you know, and boy, that, then the whole world changed. Because here, here were books with adventures about boys, you know, being lost in the wilderness and having to survive. And, you know, so many wonderful books about stories about children, which were interesting. So at that point, my whole opinion about literature, reading changed. You know. um, then the, for my teachers, my, my family, there wasn't much literary stuff going on. My mother and some things, but, but there wasn't a lot, you know. My godmother was giving me some Christian books, but they were very, you know, ethical, moral type things. They were nice, you know. But um, in this public schools, there were some things there, some stimulating things were there, you know, just in the church, some things. But then in high school, you started to get into people in the secondary of some people. One of my uh, uh, professors, Benjamin Leaf, very nice guy, uh, he gave me just a, you know, a fourth hand photocopy of a, um, uh, the, the best literature in the Western, Western world, classics, you know, Candide and Rousseau and this kind of stuff. So I started reading some of those and th- those were good, you know. And then I think not so much the teachers, but, but authors would refer to other books and I would look for those. And I got into Albert Camus and, and so many things. And Shakespeare was really difficult because the language is difficult, you know. It's very, very, uh, you know, it's 500 year old language and stuff and the concepts, but then somewhere along there, yeah, after I became a devotee, I started like looking at the stuff. And one thing is interesting because I, a, a very big, big volume, in the, the complete works of Shakespeare, it was the river, river source, something or other thing, but it was very attractive, you know, the complete works of Shakespeare. And so I remember I, I got that, <clears throat> and that's when I started to like, um, you know, begin to get back into the relationship to Shakespeare. But Shakespeare was just one of the people, like I mentioned, and others, other, other, others such as, especially Albert Camus, Carl Jung, especially Carl we've Young, gotten yeah. into now, probably recommended. Yeah. Yeah. One point here, you're like this. Um, I remember, I can remember, it was in the, uh, the quadrangle of the Guru Kula in, uh, in Vrindavan, and Gopi Puranadana. We knew each other a little bit, so we saw each other. We said, oh, hello, hello, you know, we're talking. And I was talking about how I was having this success in preaching, and even amongst devotees and stuff, um, you know, by with classical literature and looking at Shakespeare and reaching out. And we've had very good success with it, approaching very prominent people. Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said one time, and I think he was there, he said, Prabhupada gave an entire lecture on the Merchant of Venice in London one okay. evening. Yeah. Oh. And then he said sometime later he found, he stumbled in a bookstore in Calcutta on uh, uh, a book, I think it was called uh, Venetia Vonick. Venetia <laughs> okay. Vonick. 
<laughs> and it was like a Bengali translation. It's like you're saying that sometime there during the Raja or, or after, you know, people, you know, people in India also were there. So it, it appears that, uh, you know, Prabhupada, it, it's like there's so many things that Prabhupada wanted to do. He gave us the basis. He's a, a, the foundation. He's the founder of Charya. And we're building upon things that people have built on upon Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's foundation. But I think there's a lot of space in the foundation where nobody has even started to build. You know, like I mean, how many people do you know are working with Carl Jung? You know, it's it's. Yeah. But but at the same time, some some people, who's our sannyasi from Russia, Bhakta Bhakta Vigyan Maharaj. Yeah, I was just I just met him in passing. We we're both running a different direction in Mayapur. He said, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" I said, "I'm working with Jung a bit." And he said, "Oh, Jung is essential for our preaching." Oh, <laughs> but of course he's a Russian. He's a Russian, and you know, they're very uh, mental people. Oh. In Russia, there are two options in the winter time. When Russian devotee told me this, Vashishta, there's two options in the winter in Russia time. You can drink alcohol or you can read. Yeah. And he said most people do both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So very intense, you know, profound literary tradition. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, so Maharaj, when you said Prabhupada gave a lecture on Merchant of Venice, is that recorded? Or I th- yeah. No, but wait, the way Gopi Puranam was the way Gopi Puranam was talking about it, it was like maybe some maybe like there were six, ten, eight people there one evening and Prabhupada was giving his lecture darshan thing and he went into it. Because oh. um, I, I think it's a fact that I can of course many stories that Prabhupada specifically avoided dealing with certain things because he was and it was the acharya for common people and therefore you know so people wouldn't be confused he, he avoided hatha yoga he you know he wouldn't associate in certain places and, and some people like that remember his name now bhagavat there's a whole story about how Prabhupada was talking so enthusiastically about gandhi the evening before with bhagavat on the, the rooms of the, of the buildings in bombay and they had those buildings there when they first took over and Bhagavad said everybody had left and Prabhupada started talking about Gandhi and he was going on about him, how wonderful he was and such you know, a nice feeling and sentiment, you know. So next day they were walking on the beach in Bombay and they, they, went, they went farther than they normally did. And then, then finally Prabhupada stopped and turned, you know, away from the beach and just folded his hands and did pranams, you know. And everybody was thinking maybe Narada Muni had, had come or something because nobody could see anything. But then Bhagavad was looking and, and the distance was very, very nice. You know, a little monument with a, a bust of Gandhi. And so he was thinking, wow, Prabhupada. My God. One, uh, maybe Mr. Patel or somebody started talking all about the glories of Gandhi, you know. And he was on Prabhupada's left and Bhagavad was on his right. And Prabhupada was kind of tolerating for a while. But then he, then he, then he, he said but, you know, something about, but that is not philosophy. And you know, kind of minimizing Gandhi to some degree, you know. But then he turned to Bhagavad and, and on his right side. And he winked, you know, at, at him. <laughs> like, you know, meaning, you you know how I feel about Gandhi, but here it is. I have to talk to these people and so on. So we're gonna, you know, carry on our our role as the acharya, you know, yeah. Um, but different different. And when they did it, if they did it properly, sometimes Prabhupada would stop it. Other times he, he would say, "Yeah, okay, you've done it well. This is good. It's a good thing you've done." And so that it is. You're saying it's a big challenge. Not to get sucked up into the, you know, the, the the passion of the Mahabharata or the passion of Shakespeare, you know, and look for the, uh, the spiritual advantage you know, of it. You know. mm-hmm. This is amazing, Maharaj. What you said that there are dimensions of Prabhupada which most of us are not aware of. Oh. <laughs> there's so many aspects. I recently came across a quote of Prabhupada where mm-hmm. Prabhupada is telling that if you are approaching educated people, then they will be puffed up. And he says, they have a right to be puffed up. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, rather than telling, he says, you should learn the art of approaching such people and appreciating different points of view. So this is, that is quite amazing. So there is, so it seems Prabhupada was very multifaceted and he used different approaches at different times. And sometimes oh, yes. we have reduced him to maybe one particular approach. Uh, that is the prominent image of him in our movement. So uh, I, I would never have dreamt from what I knew that Prabhupada would give a talk on Merchant of Venice. So, mm-hmm. But again, it was 
Uh, yeah, you know, Gopi Paranadana was there, small people in Bengal, or, in, sorry, in, in England, in England, okay. you know. So, you know, what, what better place? Yeah. When, when, what another devotee told me was that Badravard Das, he was there in, in Paris with Hansa Duda, I think, or something like that, you know, Bhagavan. And so Prabhupada came and, you know, French people are very, you know, very famous for being arrogant and you know, everything else, you know, so on. Yeah. So it was a big hall and they did good advertising and maybe like, you know, maybe 400 people or something, you know. And, uh, and uh, he said, you know, Prabhupada came up there and was, you know, like very regularly and he could tell all the French people were immediately like, you know, very, very, you know, suspicious and everything else. So he started to introduce him Kirtan and he said, and he probably, he said, Prabhupada said, he said, I hear that French people are very fond of revolution. So I propose a revolution. <laughs> he said, Bong. It was going, it was beaver to Prabhupada. Everybody was like, yeah, yeah. everybody. And then he finished it off and he said, okay, so now we're going to be installing these deities of Radha and Krishna. Krishna has his consort, his lover, you know, and uh, we're going to be in, installing uh, our Radha Krishna deities here because we hear that uh, French women are among the most beautiful in the world. <laughs> so, and, and he went on about it. also made me a French girlfriend, you know, he finished off that way. And then you know, they, so, you know, it, it's exactly, you know, how to, uh, to touch people, you know, and not, not in, not in any, in any way invalid. Yeah, yeah, French. I mean, Krishna, Krishna probably did go to Paris because he's looking for a French girlfriend. <laughs> but, I mean, I've seen these kind of things. I'm sorry to say, you know, just, you're worshiping yeah. a, you're worshiping mm -hmm. a, you know, kind of a strange kid. <laughs> strange kid. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want. Mm. Yeah. As you, this point about uh, Merchant of Venice, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. In, oh my goodness. In today's world, there is a there's a whole series of books which they call as popular philosophy. Oh, yeah. And Blackwell, one of the publishers that published it. And they are, oh. of course, mostly engaging it with uh, contemporary culture. So they have Star Wars and philosophy, Harry Potter and philosophy, mm -hmm. and Doctor mm -hmm. Who and philosophy. And it seems these books do quite well. And they, yeah. are, they, uh, they of course, they don't do as well as the, t as the movies or TV serials. But still, mm. somewhere, it's a way, so what, just as there's there are science popularizers, there are scientists, and there are those who, who are popular science writers. They make scientific concepts accessible. Mm -hmm. So this is this whole genre of writers, they call themselves as popular, popular philosophy writers. So, so science, philosophy popularizers. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <Yeah>. actually, <laughs> yeah. no, once in, once in America also when I was there, I gave a oh. talk on Star Wars and uh, Bhakti Wisdom. Oh. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite a big thing yeah. and a lot of correlations, but I didn't dare to put yeah. that talk online anywhere because yeah. the first question would have come is what is the Indian Brahmachari doing even knowing about Star Wars? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. actually, I found reading that book was very informative because it just I read the book about Star Wars and philosophy, popular philosophy. So I found that these are very these are ways in which we can reach intellectual people who will not directly read didactic or or say a particular traditions books but yeah uh, yes Maharaj. no it, it is uh, and boy i mean uh, boy how how long can you be fascinated by a godless display of energy i mean it's probably science says that, okay you Beautiful. put mixed carbon di by carbonate of the soda and vinegar and pop the top off of your jar in your kitchen or something okay mm -hmm. you know and so you have different effects, but everybody, you know, basically Papa says, as soon as you have a human body, you're interested in, in deeper, deeper questions about, you know, for example, Hamlet is, is, is I mean, so many things. Hamlet is full of this, this concept of betrayal. Yeah. You know, it's, it's there with his, with his uncle. And it's even, it's also there with his mother, you know, yeah, mother. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the concept of betrayal and, and, and trust, you know, is extremely, who is trustworthy? Yeah, yeah. And who is trustworthy with what? With our money or with, or with the, the most, uh, most confidential things within our heart? 
you know, dadati pratigui nati gui amakyati prachiti. So we learn different kinds of people to talk about these things, and that's what, you know, influences the Baba, the advance, you know. So it's a very, very, uh, so these people like Steven Spielberg and, and different people like that, they, the ones that become classics, world classical literature, it's not that they see philosophy, dry, big, logical stuff. Yeah, maybe they have some bigger, bigger logical concept in the thing, but it's more, it's, it goes beyond that to the iconographic level, the Baba, mm-hmm. so the booty, and it touches these icon, iconic you know, images you know, the, the virgin shrouded in snow, the youth pined away with desire. Beautiful. So how, did, how are you connecting iconography? And all these people. Yeah. Yeah. How are you connecting iconography with bhava and buddhi? Are you saying that this iconography resonates with the deepest emotions yeah. in the human heart or the deepest longings of the intellect? Or how, how are you connecting the two? This is a whole, a whole section on Sankhya. This is the one we're doing now. Uh, boy. The mind is engaged in thinking, an- analytical process, mathematics, grammar. You know, according to Carl Jung, others, this all goes on pretty much in the head. You know, I'm thinking about these things. In the mode of ignorance, I'm involved in the senses. I become absorbed in seeing something. I lose, I lose my intelligence by seeing an attractive physical thing. It's there, but but it's absorbed. You know, all the water is absorbed in the sponge. There's no water anywhere, but it's there. You know? so I become absorbed in the sensual. sensual Experience. And someone slaps me and says, "Come to your senses, man." <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so, so not you're not not absorbing the sense objects. You're absorbing your senses. Okay. And behind it, maybe a little bit of thought process running to be able to put your pants on properly. You know, and not you know, and tie your tie. And, okay. But then somebody else is more more civilized. Uh, we call it uh, anamaya, pranamaya, manamaya. Hmm. Okay. He's dignified person. He plans, he thinks, he makes arrangements, has ethics, ethical and moral, moral things. But this is where Jung was going beyond the manas, you know, Indriya, manas, you know, a whole big lecture, um, and then booty, you know. So the level of booty, uh, introduction to nectar of instruction, probably says Krishna consciousness depends upon the attitude of yeah, the follower. Attitude of the follower, yes. So your booty establishes your perspective, your attitude. Uh, Antarastrita Sri Krishna Bhavanam Rita Sangha. So the, the word you know, Prabhupada is using for consciousness, which I think that matches the hippie word, which is coming from Carl Jung, uh, oh, okay. is bhava. So what is your bhava? What is your attitude? What is your perspective? What is, and this is what you and other people are calling um, iconographic thinking as opposed to this linear logical thinking, which is more in the mode of passion, the mind. The iconograph is the, the mantra, the yantra, is something which we can take in all at one time. It's a, it's, if you take the West Bharata Muni, this is Nectar of a Devotion, by Bhakti Rasmita Sindhu, for Aristotle, the essence of the drama was the plot. You know, uh, One Manipuri boy's sister is kidnapped, by evil Burmese drug dealers. So he gets some friends and they go and rescue his sister and blow up the, the, the drug factories. You know? Kung Fu killers of Hare Krishna Mountain. Okay, so you, <laughs> you see, it's a plot. It's a plot. It should go into one sentence. This is a very important thing. You should be able to state the whole plot for the whole movie in one sentence, really, basically. Okay, but for Aristotle, it was it was the plot, but for Bartamuni, it was the Baba. That when you come out of the movie, you should have a different perspective on things. It should, should have touched your heart and changed the, the bhava, your, your, your icon, iconographic you know, view of the world is changing. Yeah, so that's how you know, using the word. Yeah. So is it uh, something similar to we talk about the brain polarity, the logical brain and the, the right brain and the left brain, one is more intuitive and the other is more uh, rational and step-by-step step linear? I would, I would say it's more. It's behind that, you know. The I would say the mind access. The mind uses the brain, but the brain is based upon the bhava, you know. Okay. And so when we die, the you know, if a lot of the, the mind is based upon, uh, uh, yeah, a certain kind of brain, you know, then it gets lost in the process, you know. But if it's based upon, uh, 
Baba Budi, then it survives, you know, or that, go, that it goes on to the next body. We can carry mental substance with us. We can't get the, phys the physical body is gone. Okay, yeah. But yeah, some thoughts and complexes of thoughts using, you know, Jungian terms and modern terms, those go with us. And people, you know, what do they call child prodigies? There's one. Just look up child prodigies on the YouTube, and boy, you'll find, you know, atom bombs against, uh, you know, for, for reincarnation. But then behind that, the, the Baba, the perspective, the attitude, that yam 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 bapi, smaram bhavan. The Baba, the attitude, the perspective. And some babies are born with terror in their eyes, and some babies are born with, you know, the world is meant to give me candy, you know. Women know this, yeah. But babies from the second they're they, yeah, they in the womb, they got a different attitude, different baba about things. Yeah. So the left right brain, I think, I think is more dependent upon, you know, that's that's there. It's, it's in psychology and if it's neurophysiology and also in the Vedas, you know, mm. De, Devahu and Deva Pit is it Devahu, Devahu and Pitrahu, whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one is more, I would say, yeah, one is more more related to um, you know. Mm. Bodhi and one is more related to Indriya, yeah, logical thinking, yeah. Yes, I but as you see, it's a big area to try and connect these things because when you connect them, uh, so it's like, you know, as soon as, as soon as Prabhupada was able to start making movies, right, things changed. As soon as Prabhupada was able to get a, what's it called, it's called linotype machine, a, it wasn't a Xerox machine, but it was similar, then he could start producing a magazine, you yeah? So as soon as we have access to all of the Jungian language and all, or Shakespearean, all the Shakespearean stuff, you know, we can start putting messages across like anything, you know, to certain communities. Mm -hmm. This is my icon. This is my culture. I mean, what, what, are, what are the American icons? America, forget England for a while. Statue of Liberty? Now, these are images, but personalities that, that Americans identify with and, you know, you know. Maybe Washington, George Washington, or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about James Bond? Okay, <laughs> are you talking about that? Okay, yeah, yeah. James Bond. Yeah. yeah, this is what. Yeah. Now notice, uh, James Bond. I think. I think. Yeah, uh, like something like, you know, th th what, over over two thousand people have tried to kill James Bond. <laughs> 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 Rah, Palma was watching one of these things, and he said, "I'm still alive." <laughs> <laughs> and, and James Bond has killed something like I don't know a thousand people, and he's had uh, I guess we got get uh, I'm not sure they're illicit or not, but I guess they're illicit, illicit sexual relation with something like six, uh, you know, one hundred and seventy-eight women or something like that. You know, so th this is you know only God can do this. You know? um, and if you notice, it's gone on. I remember the first movies when I was I was in high school. And saw it. So you see, it's gone on as a, as it's been a it's been a popular. American iconographic figure since the very beginning of who we are. Uh, we are people who don't necessarily trust our institution. James Bond many times has to take things in his own hand and disobey his authorities. And the Americans do that. British and Germans don't do that. You know, Americans, you know, we have this whole thing of being rebellious against authorities. Yeah. Now, Americans generated their consciousness of who they were out of out of revolution, right? They killed their relationship. They engaged in a little bit of patricide. Canada didn't. Canadians consider themselves a part of the Commonwealth. You know, so if so, Americans don't have any heritage. So you may notice that James Bond is an American icon, but he is a British, British. spy. Okay, but still, he became because, an icon. Yeah, we have to have. Who are we? We have to have our our parents and our, our ancestors, you know. So Americans want this. You know, they want to have the British heritage, but at the same time, too, they want to, you know, reject it. And that's why you're going to get, you know, preaching to this kind of people, getting messages across, getting mass media messages across. You've got to realize these things. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, these are many fascinating subjects and. We would love to discuss uh, these in future podcasts. If we come back to Shakespeare for now, so if I understand, sure. the, <laughs> yeah, why not? If I understand the flow, what you're saying is Shakespeare's works have contributed to many of the icons that shape Western civilization, and that's why we can connect 
if we can connect with those icons then our message will become much more accessible and uh, and relevant for people yeah, and, and and the other side of the coin is that people who have been raised up within this iconography which is you know anybody anybody who was a part of the british empire you know mm. which includes america and includes india um, then we'll be able to understand understand the messages in the Bhagavatam from the perspective. Ah, now I understand. You know, for example, it's, uh, uh, it's only basically through Shakespeare and things like that that I can understand what a king is. You never had a king in America, you know, contemporary ideology. So it has to go back to our our, our, our cultural heritage for me to understand what it what is you know this whole site, idea of civilization of royalty and and that kind of, of reality. But in India, you have that, you know, you have that heritage and stuff. And so it's British took, it's very easy. He's our king. In America, we don't have kings. <laughs> we have the exact office, we killed them, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so fascism, fascism didn't take off well here. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But in Germany and, uh, and, and uh, you know, in Japan, it took off well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so, they were. Yeah. Maharaj, for this level of engagement, I think uh, the two things, like you first said, not many people read books. So even those devotees who are going to engage in this level, they are not going to be many at one level. And another thing is that uh, while engaging at this level, we may have to uh, maybe refine our definition of preaching. Because through this, it's not necessarily people may immediately become devotees, but it says the bridges can be built and at least something which is incomprehensible becomes <laughs> intelligible. Okay, this is what, yeah. what you are saying. This is what you believe. This is what you people do. Yeah. In one sense, it's it's a more subtle, we could say foundational level of outreach. Isn't it? Uh, it it's, it's, it very much has that aspect to it, I would say. Very much. But on the other, other hand, yeah, I mean, if you can, I remember there's one big GBC controversy. Right after Prabhupada left, then we had the, we made this big mistake about zone lacharyas and and everybody Hansaduda, Bhagavan, uh, Jayadir, <laughs> Krishna Maharaj. They, they, you know, we were very confused in many ways. You know, so also, oh, okay, Prabhupada was our guru, and now all of them have to be new Prabhupads. Hmm. And that was that was you know a very simple understanding the situation. So I, I went through it with Hansa Duda in Berkeley. He was our Acharya. And when he had his like kind of fall down and then they wanted um, everybody, all the disciples he had made, quite a few, you know, hundreds, uh, to, uh, to to immediately take shelter. To be, they had to have somebody. They had to be reinitiated immediately by somebody else. And and they were sending uh, Rameshwar, Bhavananda, and Hridayananda were, were, were being pushed in there, you know, so on. You know? And uh, okay, they should do. And uh, some people were inclined to support this. Some people weren't. I wasn't. You know. And so then I was just thinking that um, uh, what was it? Uh, um, that I was just mentioning. I just mentioned that. Wow, you know, the same thing in Hamlet. That is, you know, his. <clears throat> he was very disturbed because his his uh, his mother, you know, when her her his her her her, father, her husband, uh, but older died. Yeah, yeah. Then she, then she, then she got very quickly remarried, and he, he said he told his friend Horatio. Horatio came and said, "Oh, I came to see the your father's funeral," and he said, "No, don't say that. Say you came to see my mother's marriage." And Horatio uh -huh. said, "Yeah, well, they they came a, a little quick one after the other, you know." And uh, then Hamlet said, "Oh, no, no, we should be thrifty. The the cold the the cooked meat at the funeral feast did but do double double duty." As cold cuts at the wedding feast, you know, she got remarried. She remarried so quick the meat wasn't even cold from the funeral, you know. And that it, I just saw. Wow, a Trey Rishi, Subdhamana Mars, Trivikram They all went, yeah. If somebody's been initiated by a guru, it's a fact. This is a, this is a very deep personal thing. You can't just go shoving them to be initiated by somebody else. It's actually unchaste, you know, for us even to ask such a question. So I saw how the words just boom, and it, you know, it was deep. It was even me, you know. My God. Yes. Yeah. The cold cuts from the wedding feast. <laughs> and the palau, 
the the rice from the <laughs> Jamastami feast was used as palau for Prabhupada's, you know, okay. what do you call it? <laughs> feast, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in one sense, just like, uh, say, when we become Krishna conscious, we see Shastra and scriptural themes being reenacted or scriptural points being demonstrated in the world around us. Mm -hmm. So similarly, if somebody has read Shakespeare and has internalized it, then they will also see it. So in a sense, that is also like a living text yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. which can enhance our vision. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's... And, and then we can, Hans Aduda told us that Prabhupada said, every single psychological circumstance you can encounter is in Srimad Bhagavatam. And so, We'll see it in these classical stories that people are kind of like using to decide who I am. And we'll just see it in people's dealings. And we'll see, okay, this is what's happening. I'm in this drama now. And the Bhagavatam tells me how to make this a, 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 a wholesome drama, a healthy drama. It tells me what's going to happen. It tells me who's going to make this out, out alive and how to help them play their role properly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so Maharaj, Continuing with this point now about you know how you were able to see in one sense a reenactment of the of the Hamlet in the situation the in Iskon at that time, what Gertrude did yeah. at that time. So yeah. when we were seeing say Shakespeare with from a Krishna conscious perspective, so what all? So do we see that uh, at one level Shakespeare himself was a religious person? And he wove into these themes, or is it that by our Krishna conscious we can see uni there are universal themes which we see over there, or is it uh, how, how do we how does the Krishna conscious vision of such uh, such uh, literary figures work? Um, the, the the ambience. Can I share my screen for one second? Yes, yes, please, Maharaj. So here we have the gop gopis praying praying to God as Durga. Hmm. Okay, and. The, Prabhupada says, you know, we can use anything for Krishna, you know, it's a motivation. Uh, but Lord Chaitanya, uh, you know, listening to Sarvabhoma, you know, okay. adjusting to Prakashananda. Okay. And here's Hansaduda with Prabhupada. And uh, there's a brahmachari behind them there. You know who that is? No, it's you. It's, uh, I forgot his name, Sue, Sue something. That's Bhakti Bhushan Maharaj when he was a brahmachari. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Shuti Priya Devi is his good disciple. Yeah. Thank you. And this is Srub Damarar, you know, Maharaj. You know, he's, okay. he, he's, he's dressed all up you know, and, mm. and presenting himself all within their language, within their perspective, quoting their authorities. And of course, I worked with the Bhaktivedanta Institute. It was very natural. You know? mm -hmm. uh, okay. So here we have it, you know. So we have uh, Rupa Goswami, 1489-1564, Nartam Das Thakur, 1530. And then we have Shakespeare. So you, you see uh, Shakespeare's, uh, he was baptized uh, 1564 and died uh, 16, no, no, it was ago, 1616. Yeah, April 16th. And do you know uh, uh, Miguel Cervantes? And yeah. you know yeah, I've heard about him. Yeah. yeah, I've read several of his quotes and not really read him directly. But Don Quixote. Oh, yeah, Don Quixote. Yeah. If you I, look I, at the best. Yeah. In my childhood, yes. I read a child, uh, children's retelling of that, bo that book, but I haven't read it yeah. in my adulthood. Yeah. Well, if you look at, you know, contemporary, you know, every few years they have some big university does it. What are the 50 best books in the world? And uh, Don Quixote always comes out in the top 10, and many times it's considered the best. And the difficulty is the translation, but now there's a, a, a good translation of it. And this is another area. But you notice they're, 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 they're the dates of their death, the two of them? Oh, almost the same. It's just very one day apart. That's a little spooky, isn't it? <laughs> so. And they are, you know, this is what's happening on the continent. Uh, on the continent, you know, is in Spain with a tremendous literary tradition, which influences all of South America and so many people, you know, 
uh, I, my hypothesis now, Krishna consciousness was that they were both pets of the same Gandharva. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> one, yeah, one, one, I think a master's thesis guy, he said, oh, Miguel Cervantes and William Shakespeare were the same person or something. You know, okay, it's crazy. You know? But then he went and did, a, I think, a computer, a computer analysis of the use of different kinds of metaphors and things like this. And as, as I heard, it came back, you know, far higher than would have occurred by chance. And they were using same metaphors and same things like that and so on. So anyway, this is like the ambience. And so from Cervantes, you can understand how things were in Spain at that time. From Agatha Christie, you can understand how things were right after World War II, if you want, if you want to read some exciting, you know, detective novels, you know, yeah. Um, so at that time of Shakespeare, basically there, I think as far as, Shakespeare was either, uh, in Shakespeare you'll find Christianity and you'll find Greek philosophy. You know, you'll find Romans and the, the, the Latin and Greeks, the classics had carried right in. in. Oxford, they would study the classics, the classics. And that was a big deal of was learning if you knew Greek, if you knew Latin, if you knew the classics. You know? and so they had Oedipus and, and, and things like this. And, uh, you know, what, what is it? How, how, how many of Shakespeare's plays are basically, uh, uh, you know, Roman themes? You know, Julius Caesar. Uh, yeah. It's most powerful, you know. You know, the, the Hamlet, Hamlet uses uh, phrases, he uses the example of Caesar to emphasize one of his points, a very important point, very nice point. So that at that time, there was a strong ambience of the Greek classics and classical Greek and Roman culture. And also then the other, other traditions, you see these lines in our culture, which is the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, hmm. Judeo-Christian tradition, which had passed through Rome but still was its own own character and these were heavy things i mean yeah you, you know you know the the, the, the protestants versus the uh the, the catholics, catholics versus the, what, what do you call it and the reformation. you know were, the reformation yeah they were killing each other like anything over over one or two phrases they became so fanatics you know yeah and so he had access to these traditions now hamlet i don't know if you've discovered this Shakespeare didn't invent the, the Baba, the motif, anything. It was coming from an earlier German German story, history about this thing. And the Lion King is based upon, yeah. And so if this goes back, I don't know how far how far back this go. Do we know anybody, do we know any 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 brother, younger brother who, who revolted against his older brother after he was gone and didn't give fair treatment to the sons and the cousins? <laughs> well... Dhritarashtra was the older brother, but that yeah. happened. Yeah. Okay. And you can see this. Wow. The, you know, and in, in uh, Macbeth. Oh gosh. You know, I mean, one time we were doing uh, this this Shakespeare thing. You know, in a big university, one of the biggest universities, and it's most powerful universities in Chile. Uh, what's it, what is it? Uh, Universidad Católica in uh, in the uh, south. Uh, what is it? Uh, San, San Santiago, Santiago, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I, and we, I, 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 you know, you know, we are Catholic. Okay, thank you. We have <laughs> we have the voice from the sky here. University <laughs> like Católica, Santiago. Very, very nice. Oh yeah, very, very, very nice. It's very respected. When people, when you tell people they were doing programs there in in, in uh, Chile, they go, "Oh, really? Wow! You know, you've gotten in there. Yeah, and respected." Okay. So anyway, I, I was I made my presentation of the, of the ontology, which is where Hamlet describes, uh, you know, what is the world, what happens when you die, how you go to different places, and it's such an identical, you know, cosmology with the Vedas in so many ways, and it's, it's presented in such an intense fashion, you know. But also the second theme, of course, is the fact about his mother's remarriage, the second betrayal, and he discovers that. Uh, by uh, he does, both of them, he tests them by presenting a drama. He yeah. has some people who he knows. He says, "Can you do this drama tonight before the king and the queen?" Oh, yeah, we well, we can do that. And I want to rewrite rewrite some of your lines a little bit. Can you pick them up? Yes, sir. Of course, we can pick them up. So he, he reenacts the murder of his father the way the ghost told him it happened, and his uncle just becomes flipped out and goes out. You know, 
He says, aha, this is confirmed. Ghost is not lying. And then he has a scene where, uh, you know, in the play, the, the, old, the older king in the play, he tells his younger wife, just like Hamlet's father and mother. And the old king says, you know, I'm, I'll be dying soon and, and, and you're young. So after I'm gone, you should, should. And she says, oh, no, never say remarriage, you know, like that, you know. Uh, I'm, uh, she goes on talking about how, you know, let me be chained up in the prison with no hope and, and all these things. And let me suffer a thousand deaths, you know, rather than get remarried, you know. And then she has a very, very nice line. She says, uh, 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 they say a woman who kisses a second man in bed kills the first one twice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is proof. So we uh, was it Krasungi? One of our, uh, I think it was Krasungi, one of our disciples there. She became a professional actress. And we were just reading this in front of the class and everything else. And I was taking the point of the, the, the king and she was taking the point of, the, of uh, what do you call it? Um, the, the player queen, and she broke down. You know, she could not handle it. It was just, it was so intense and stuff like that. She started laughing at stuff, but she just couldn't handle it, you know, the, the communication. So this is a big issue. I mean, are we, are we, are we dealing with the, with the issue of remarriage in ISKCON? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Under what circumstances is a girl allowed to remarry? Mm. Yeah, in ISKCON. I can actually start getting into it more deeply now, but the Parasaras Dharma Shastra talks about this. Prabhupada recommends Parasaras Dharma Shastra. He talks about this whole issue of remarriage. And if you want to, and if you go through looking at it in terms of, uh, you know, how Hamlet's dealing with it, he's dealing with the whole issue like that and stuff. And you can see like, it brings it right to home about, wow, this is a, so for example, a girl thinking about remarriage and then she's, Hearing Hamlet, and she goes, "Hey, this is this is, this is not just my life. This is my kids, you know. And I can see this is a big deal. Now, my getting remarried has a really heavy impact. I have a heavy impact on my children. You know? So let me think again. <laughs> let, let me wait in. Let me not use the cold cuts for. Let me not use the cooked meat from the funeral feast for cold cuts for my wedding. I mean, per, how, how long does Parasara recommend?" Let the wife wait before she get remarried. I don't think you know, but it's right there. Proper recommends it. You know, he oh, says six okay. years. Six, six years. years. Oh, okay. yeah. He says first class is follow Vishnu Priya and husband takes sannyas. Don't get remarried. You become a, become a sannyasini. Second class, but still dharmic, is to get remarried. Is to not get remarried, but enjoy life. Don't become a sannyasini. Mm -hmm. And third class, but still progressive. Been called still third class, but still considered a dharmic lady. Oh, okay. So if I understand right, Maharaj, what you are saying is that uh, these, that Shakespeare's plays have universal themes yeah. which, which speak to the human experience in general. So like if you have the two points and of a uncle going against his nephews after the, uh, and then the other point of remarriage. So, yeah. so, so in that sense, if we consider that even our scriptures, they're giving spiritual wisdom, but also they're addressing the universal challenges of human existence. And those are being depicted through stories. So in yes. one sense, it's not that we are say importing or imposing some Krishna consciousness, per Krishna consciousness into Shakespeare's uh, writings. It is, there are just universal themes and we are simply observing and connecting. Yeah, but... And, and, and again, again, the ambience is completely religious. There is an afterlife. There is a God who watches things. People are punished for their, for their sins. You know, um, Baba and these higher sentiments, that's, I think we're going to find some of these within Hamlet and, and, and within Shakespeare's works. But most of them are a lot, a lot just about, you know, uh, the, the future, our future life and how it's, you know, you know yeah. a after hearing, uh, you know, after seeing the play, you know, seeing because mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? Like his father, his father Claudius, I guess. What Claudius? Claudius, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he you know better than I do. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> after he sees it, maybe God's doing this. He goes off, and the Hamlet finds him, you know, in, in, in one one quarter of the palace. But there's a very nice soliloquy, as you saw it in our in our our drama that we took it, and 
uh, Claudius is talking to himself and he said, you know, my sin hath the, prim the primal eldest curse upon it, a, a brother's murder. And that was the first sin, the killing of Cain. It was a Cain, Cain killed Abel. Yeah. The two brothers of Adam. Now, and this, this is considered the oldest, the oldest and most reprehensible sin to kill your brother. It's a, one of the most most horrible things that you can do in Christianity is is a pat is a what's it called pat, patricide. Patricide. Fratricide. 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 Fratricide's a deep thing. You know? Yeah. And he said, so he says, My my sin has the, the most horrible, you know, curse upon it, the killing of a brother. I kill my brother, you know. And and uh <clears throat> but but isn't there enough? But but isn't there great force in prayer? Hey, we're coming right to our Krishna consciousness, Bhakti Yoga. How much force is there in chanting the holy names and, and things like this? So he says, isn't there a lot of so much prayer, force in prayer, that it can keep us from falling down? And once we fall down, it can it can raise us back up. You know. So this is exactly what Rupa Goswami discusses, right, in the beginning of. Uh, you know, it's pro prophylactic and antiseptic. Yeah. Those are the two. Yes, Maharaj. At that point, as one more thing struck me, that at that time... Holy names, and once we're fallen, yeah. it purifies us. So I, I, identical conception is right there. Yes, So he says, he says, okay, but let me kneel and pray and, you know, and uh, I said, but how can I pray for, for forgiveness from God when I'm still possessed of those things for which I did did commit the sin, my crown, my kingdom, my queen, I'm still hanging on to these things, right? So, which offense is this? Offense and to continue sinful activities on the strength of the holy name. Ninth offense. No, no, ma maintaining material attachments. Even after, yeah. Okay, he's not giving up his attachments to, and he realizes that I it's. I can pray to God, but look, how can I pray sincerely if I'm still keeping these things, which I you know, which, which I wish to be forbidden? Yeah. Yes, he says, okay, the, trying to translate this into modern modern uh, Spanish was, oh boy, it was a trip. You know? yeah. um, he talks about having ha stiff legs, bend, you know, my, my bend down, oh, stiff legs, and <laughs> let me pray to God, you know? So he bends and he prays. He's praying to God to be forgiven for his sins and see maybe something will happen. So that's when Hamlet enters. You see, you did a yeah. little dramatic thing in the PowerPoint show, you know. Yes, and Hamlet sees him and and Hamlet says, Yam Yam Bobby Smud. Oh no, Hamlet yeah. says, that Now is, let, let me do it, do it pat. He pulls his dagger out and says, Now let me do it pat. And let me do it like precisely. I know he's guilty. I catch him and I'm gonna kill him. And he thinks he will go to heaven. Yam yam vapi smaram baban tiajiti anti kalevaram. Yes, Raj. That was the most amazing correlation. There are many other Pray. correlations. Yeah. Huh? No, there are many other correlations, but among everything I found in Hamlet, that thought was the most striking. Because it's so clear that the moment of death, what is if he dies now, he think he will be praying he will go to God. And I don't want him to go to God, so I won't kill him now. So, so he's using a demoniac use of, of, of transcendental knowledge, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he says, he is, this is not this is not revenge for my father. My father went to hell because he was you know caught full of bread and all of his simple reactions, like any Shatri, and he has to purge his soul. I, his only son, send his his murderer to heaven. This is not revenge, this is salary and payment. Let me catch him in a moment when he's not full of, you know, when he's when he's engaged in gambling and swearing or hunting or engaged in incest, twixt the sheets. And killing. Yeah. And, and then uh, his heel, his heels, no, his heart will depart for that hell as black as itself and his heels will kick at heaven. It is. <laughs> It's intense. Beautiful language. So it's like, you know, so maybe, yeah, yes, you see, and Prabhupada told George Harrison, Bhakti Vinotakwa said, life is temporary, like a drop of water on the least leaf of a, a lotus flower. You you say it's temporary, like the drop of water on the leaf of a rose. Baram Bhavan in a little bit modern language, and people are going to start thinking about 
start thinking about it. You know, yeah, it's a fact. And mm. It's not just getting the beer and the beer and the hot dogs. I mean, what what kind of consciousness am I am I developing? You know, am I even am, am I even a decent American? You know, what's happened to my country? You know, mm. yeah, mm. yeah. So how, uh, just exploring this point a little bit deeper. What you said, you talk about the ontology being similar. Uh, yeah. Here, it seems soteriology also seems to be similar. The way he's going, where he will go after uh, toward the end. Now, how do we understand this? Because in some ways, say the thoughts of Plato and Socrates seem to be quite similar to the Gita's insights about the soul. So, mm -hmm. so is it that while Shakespeare's environment? was mostly christian but he also derived some of his ideas from from the greco roman tradition because it seems western civilization <clears> had <throat> these two formative influences it's more like the relig religious part came from christianity and the more the rational reflective philosophical part came from the greeks so i will now quote, i will now go professor ravi gupta <laughs> i will now quote professor ravi gupta Okay. A.K.A. Radhika Ramandas. <laughs> he's <laughs> your disciple, right? <laughs> yeah. my, no, no, no. He's my he's my guru, sir. You know. Oh God. Yeah. I I I I I'm in the relationship of him with Uddhava to the gopis. Okay. Oh my God. I, I have the relationship with him. Yeah. That's that's gonna freak him out if he sees this. <laughs> <laughs> your humility is heartbreaking, Maharaj. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm Uddhava. He is the gopis. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's why when I, when I was thinking of names, that's one thinking of because he was so much involved in all this dry, you know, metaphysical stuff. You know, that's why I even thought the name name Radhika Raman might be you know it's good to you know, keep, <laughs> keep some perspective. You know, yeah. Um, but he said he said exactly that that the you'll find in Judeo Judeo Christian tradition that Jude there's not much cosmology. You look in the Bible and everything else, there's not much there. So it started becoming integrated with the, uh, you know, Emperor Constantinople and everybody else. Then they adopted the, the Greco-Roman cosmology of what is the universe, what is the soul, what is life, these kind of things. And now they're starting to reconsider, because, hey, we don't, we didn't, we didn't have to do that. That's not really, you know, from our tradition. So they're, they're looking at their own tradition. But yes, it's more, like I say, so Socratic, you know, view of the universe. Hmm. And so Socratic view also seems to be quite similar to the Gita's view. That's also, there are many points. Socratic view seems to be quite similar to Gita's view. Like, especially when his yeah. friend dies, when his, I think, friend's wife dies. And he talks about the reasons for the eternality of the soul. Mm -hmm. And don't lament because the soul, her soul mm -hmm. is eternal. That's very similar to the Gita's second chapter. Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially the Phaedo. Yeah, you know the Phaedo. Yes, that's, no, that's the, 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 the yes. It's almost like if you know, if you come to these, you know, come to these uh, this kind of atmosphere, and people are asking, "Oh, you can you study this this Indian classics a little bit?" But have you ever compared this with other people around the world? You're saying it's so great, but do you know what other people have have thought? Have you read the Phaedo? No. Okay. Oh, forget it. You know? Yeah. Oh. So you know, Dochetania is quoting. Jiva Goswami is quoting from all the different, you know, uh, Mimangsa Shastras and all these things. And the Sandarbha is what I understand. He's, he expects that you know all these things before he starts talking about it. He's talking to postgraduate people. So the Phaedo, I think every every devotee, uh, was it the Benjamin Jowett translation, is very stimulating. And what you see is many, 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 many arguments, the classifications that Prabhupada was using in terms of a uh, what is it called? Efficient cause, ultimate cause, and material cause of things. Mm -hmm. I, what, what are these coming from? And then maybe, you know, maybe like 10, 10 12 years ago, I, these, are, these are Aristotle's categories. You know, the ultimate cause is God. The, the, uh, uh, the efficient cause is the father who gives the keys to the car to the boys. And, 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 the, and the, the, the material cause of their problem is the beer. So, so they were caught drinking after the game and, and pulled over and they ended up in jail and the police called the father and said, hey, we got your sons here. They're a little drunk and we pulled them over, you know, found some beer bottles in the car. 
So who's, who's, who's the criminal? The ultimate cause is God. The efficient cause is the father and the material cause is the beer. So do we arrest the beer? <laughs> okay, <laughs> no. pick it up. Okay. Yeah. So well, these are Aristotle's categories, you know? Mm. And he's of course the grand disciple of, uh, of Socrates. Yeah. So, so Socrates is uh, uh, the Phaedo, you find, they're arguing about the eternality of the soul. And Pop mm. Socrates says, it's not a, nobody can say, my, my greatest enemy, the com com comic philosophers, you know, the great greatest enemies, even they could not say I'm being like, you know, speculative or anything else. The glass of poison is on the table and I have a choice of taking it or not. You know? So is the soul immortal? And in so many arguments, um, you know, Alfred North Whitehead? Yeah, he was, you know, I know he's, I, I think he wrote, a, he's a prominent historian. Uh, Whitehead. Yeah, he's yeah. a prominent huh? historian, prominent historian in- he, well, he, uh, Whitehead, I think it was for, for chair of philosophy, but oh, okay. philosophy and history are tied together. You know? Yeah, he, I mean, in India, one of his quotes is quite prominently portrayed that he says, the chapter in world history which had a Western beginning needs to have an Indian ending if it is ah. not self-destruction. So, is that Whitehead, Whitehead or the other guy that Prabhupada met? Yeah, from Australia. Oh, oh it's Adder, Adder, Adder. Arnold Toynbee, sorry. Yeah, Toynbee. Uh, I mean, Toynbee is also one of these super super giants. Yeah. yeah same way. Um, but then uh, Whitehead is from Harvard also. Oh, right. But, um, I got confused. He, he says, the safest way to characterize all Western philosophy is to say that the entire thing is a footnote to Socrates. Yeah. Pa dialectical spiritualism, Pop, would like Socrates, and he liked Carl Jung, and practically speaking, everybody in between. <laughs> <laughs> he was, you know, like, you know, yeah. So the Phaedo is, like you're saying, it's, it's one concept after another, you know, and, and yeah. So world classical literature, Hamlet, cosmology, yeah. Mm. So then, you know, there are two things we broadly discussed. One is with respect to seeing, seeing, uh, so seeing Shakespeare from a Krishna conscious perspective. One yeah. is, there are ethical ethical dilemmas or life situations which are universal, mm. which are yes. And then second is that for wow. addr for addressing those issues, he draws on worldviews and motives which have significant similarities with the Vedic worldview. Yes. yes. So yes. that means both ways there are correlations. One, yes. Yeah. One thing I noticed Can... in almost all of Shakespeare's dr dramas. The supernatural plays a significant role. Ooh. The witches or the ghosts or something like that speaking. Yes. Yeah. Every year, how many, you know, supernatural ghosts and goblin movies come out? Yeah. It's a continuous appetite for those things because they're, the, they're real. People experience these things. And they, you know, they, they know these things are real. Yes. Mm -hmm. Start with ghost stories now. <laughs> <laughs> So in one sense, another way we could put it that if somebody is ca <laughs> caught in a very, very sign, very scientistic worldview, a scientism developed worldview, that you don't believe in anything beyond the senses, and the Shakespearean, oh, wow. Shakespearean, Shakespearean stories also open the world to that there is some, yes. there is a reality beyond the senses, even if there yes. is no explicit picture of God there, yes, but yes. there is definitely a uh, that there is much more to what is that. I think he says Horatio that there is much more in the world than what your philosophy can imagine. Yeah, yeah. There are many things in the world which is like, yeah, neither your nor my philosophy. I forgot, yeah. yeah, I should know it. Yeah. There are more yeah. things in this world than were ever conceived in your your or mine philosophy, Horatio. Yeah. Actually, I also forgot. I quoted that in my book on the reincarnation. Ah. Uh -huh. The starting yeah. point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So the super, so now the supernatural. I'm just trying to analyze that: are there some things in Shakespeare which we can say that they couldn't have come from a Christian influence? They like it's not just universal religious themes. Like say that the idea of like a providence shaping the ends that we could say that is a general religious theme. It doesn't have to be distinctively Vedic or, but mm -hmm. the idea of yam yam vapis maran, 
where a person goes at the time of that i don't i don't know whether it's that explicitly mentioned in the bible it does seem to be very strikingly geeta centered as you sow so shall you reap that is there but, okay. but the, the the whole conclusion of hamlet he's just like arjuna he does not want to to have to deal with this problem he does not want to deal with it and, but then his uncle tries to kill him but the killers are killed he takes he's on a boat out of the country but he's tossed overboard the ocean brings him back <clears throat> his own investigation just you know to see if the ghost is telling the truth brings him back and, and so finally he's there in the final scene and he tells horatio and this i think is maybe one of the most key things in the entire thing he says all of us have a destiny o horatio even though it may be roughly cut roughly hewn it's not like it's tied down at every moment he says but it's there you got your kind of limits you know and mm -hmm. we can but be good players you know accepting our destiny you know all the world's the stage the men and women they're in mere actors they have their entrances and their exits and the man in his life plays seven parts you know that's 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 Romeo that's uh, as you like it but that is just exactly according to Bhagavad Gita about you know Jad as ago uh Vasamsi Jena they know for you Yeah, youth to youth, youth to boyhood to old age. You know, yeah. identical. And so Solomon uses the same example. King Solomon, I've heard. So okay. So the idea of 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 that we have a karma. You know, in America, you're not going to say, "Oh, we have karma." Some people now they'll accept it, but the word in America uses is destiny. All all of us. It seems that many of us are are destined to end up in a certain profession and certain position in life. And so many people, a little more experienced, are going to go, "Yeah." That was how the Emperor of Japan stopped the Second World War. They wanted to fight on. They were ready to fight on and cause ca ca cause America the death of two million people before they surrendered. Yeah, they were ready. Yep, the American army knew it. They knew this is with if we invade mainland Japan, we're talking about look at it. we our plan is there, but it's going to cost us about two million people dead before we can accomplish this. And, and the other side is going to be something like for you know, forty million divine wind has blown. And there can be no reply. You know, after the two atomic bombs, that was their idea. They would say, "Hey, we've just." He said, "You know, destiny, divine win. Destiny is now on the side of the Americans, and that's it. You can't fight it." You know, and so they accepted it. You know, and so for forty-two million people, lives were saved by the introduction of a poetic phrase, and and at the right moment. You know? oh. Yeah. The American divine wind has blown, and there can be no reply. Yeah. This is what the Japanese emperor said at that time. When he surrendered, he gave a surrender, and he he actually went against the, the, the military council and everything else. It had to be, um, he recorded it separately in case they would put him under house arrest, so he couldn't say it, so it could be broadcast to the people and stuff on, on national radio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very intense iconography. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's amazing. So, so in one sense, uh, yeah. idea is destiny is there. What I understand from the very beginning in Christianity, there was uh, Saint Jerome in 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 Rome with all the society people and good food and good drink, and there was uh, uh, Origen. In the desert with the uh, the monks who were doing severe austerities and everything else, so Origen was one of the first Christian fathers. He had no trouble with reincarnation. That was running around the whole thing like that through Socrates, everybody else, any more in Egypt, uh, and he had no problem with reincarnation being a part of Christian philosophy, you know. But Saint Jerome was off there in Rome with all what there was, which was actually their political center, and as far as I understand, that the basic Point at the Christian fathers at that point was, hey, if we tell these people they got more than one lifetime, they're never going to get serious, you know. Mm -hmm. And we got to tell them you got one life, and that's it, buddy, and you're going to be damned to hell for eternity unless you get it together. So, Tomasic Puranas, I think, present the same thing. You know, Tomasic Puranas also talk to that. You know, your soul will be damned forever if you do these things and so on. You know, yeah, because that sharp. A sharp motivation is there, so the idea of destiny 
and being born into a certain destiny, even if it's not coming. In Christianity, it's not going to come from a previous life, your destiny so much. You have an afterlife, but there's no previous life yeah. so much, not much. But that's what we need these, to stimulate these things and have these dialogues and you know find out if it's a part of that tradition, how it's the best. Yeah, maybe the other side, inter, interfaith dialogue, which is another, yeah, maybe f- four major themes we're trying to work on here. You know? We're trying to consolidate all this into all the stuff we've been doing. I'm, I'm looking at my death, you know, I'm looking at 2024. Uh, uh, what's it called? Odana Shasti. <laughs> so I'm thinking of leaving the body. So now I've been pushed everything else, time to consolidate, you know, not, no new projects. When new projects come over, I just try and stimulate other people to take them up. Uh, 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 Don Quixote and uh, Arjuna or something like that. Don Quixote and Vidura, you know, something oh, like yeah. that. Something we got here, you know, yeah. It's all right. But okay, other people can do that, you know. So that's what I'm trying to do, just consolidate like with this, this program today, put together the stuff we're doing and this the resources we have and well, let me make one movie. We want to make, a, put it together if we can make one movie called, a, it's called Ars's Diary of a Traveling Preacher, but we have Diary of a Traveling Creature, uh, The Ultimate Trip. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then we've got already got on the YouTube, we have the, the collection of the themes you want to deal with right there. And Interfaith Dialogue, uh, World Classical Literature, Science in the Vedas, and the Bhakti Vedanta Library. And those themes you have, okay. these are how we look at them. And then we want to maybe have some dialogue with all these people we've been contacting uh, in, in the outside world, you know, outside of ISKA and our community. You know, people in the United Nations, people in uh, very nice Jesuit, you know, such dialogues with, 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 with religious people is just, you know, we, 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 stand, we stand shoulder to shoulder against abortion with a lot of people, you know, and, and mm. we're, secular leaders, real, at one point, I think it was Clinton, uh, they decided, let, let's, let's give, give abortion on demand, make it available all throughout the world easily, some easy process where women can then, you know, maybe before the third month, you can have a very simple process, easily available, and have abortion. That will solve all the problems in the world in terms of hunger and you know, all this kind of stuff, poverty. Okay, we'll do it. So the secular leaders were in favor of it, and they were just shocked beyond belief because all of the religious leaders in the world, he said, he said, he said normally we're trying to kill each other. <laughs> we're fighting amongst each other. But this is something we, we've, we're all agree that we're going to put down fighting against each other because this, what you're proposing is so wrong and so bad that it's just no way on earth that any of us can even ever come close to being able to not fight to the death against this, you know, abortion beyond demand. And, and so we're going to stand against this and put all the strength we have, which is not so much, but we'll do it. And it was so shocked that the world's world's the secular leaders, they were just shocked. They just, they backed down. They said, wow, we don't want, don't want to take on Jews, Muslims, you know, Christians. All these guys together, forget it. Yeah. Mm. So there's an example that when inter- interfaith dialogue, you know, but now we're talking about you know, inter- uh, literature. Yeah. Yeah, which which is in, which is it's all connected, of course. You know. Yeah. Oh, okay. So these are very very far-reaching and foundational areas. What you're saying, world yeah. classical literature, interfaith dialogue, and uh, at least with this one, interfaith dialogue. Our yeah. movement has done something. Anuttama Prabhu has done some Christian Vaishnava dialogues and then Vaishnava Muslim dialogues. Yeah. Oh, That's a huge area. But still, at least something has happened. But I don't think hardly anything has been... Uh, science in the Vedas is also different devotees are doing something in a small way. But I think world right. classical literature is not, not been explored much at all till now. Mm. Uh, I, I had a podcast with Radhayan Maharaj and he mentioned to me that you know, he... During, during some of the traumatic times in our movement's history, he found Jane Austen's writings very helpful. So, yeah. Yeah. So that is... That also, is, in, uh, in Spanish culture, Mamar's Bhakti Sundar Goswami uh, did some things on... It was almost like interreligious. It was more interreligious. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he did a thing, I think, on one, one very, very powerful Christian saint. And then, of course, uh, Jai Waita Maharaj did uh, Ecclesiastes. Yeah, yeah, that was a very yes, good yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the... Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. So actually, when I, uh, I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, it was something. It was almost a little bit very sectarian kind of worldview I grew in. 
because in one sense i i was quite i read i had read a quite a lot of book indian authors western authors before i introduced to krishna consciousness but now see i can quote uh, in our classes i can quote say <clears throat> george bernard shaw or i can quote oscar wilde but oh. are, no no but i'm saying that it's difficult for me in today's or in today's scorn to quote say rabindranath tagore or some of the other <laughs> literary giants of the indian lit, indian yeah. history because somehow yeah. we may see that their philosophy is different from ours and then maybe they were has slightly impersonalistic orientations but independent of their philosophy they have a literary legacy which has influenced a lot of people and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we can have a we can use that for connecting with people just because yeah. we quote someone doesn't mean we accept everything that they say thank like no. you said about prabhupad prabhupad offering respects to gandhi also yeah yeah, yeah. so this is uh, i i'll ha, ha, yes yeah, sorry ha, ha, ha. no hansa duda so i some citations from me one time prabhupad said i am marx you are lenin yeah so, <laughs> oh god so, okay. because 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 if we keep our samstapaka acharya prominent in our lives yeah you know, and our and our relationship with him clear then i think we can do these things yeah mm-hmm. and then people say that okay i can see that you're you know whatever you're saying you know is is not going to be it you know i can see you're not going to budge an inch from what you which what what you're you're a guru what's his name back to vedanta you're 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 not you're not going to budge an inch from him you're you're a fanatic about that and we'll and i can see well maybe it's not fanatical it's you're really attached to him and but okay you know and so and so yeah if i try and draw you off into something about shakespeare about getting into something else and see we keep coming back every morning we have bhagavatam class every evening we have bhagavad gita class and it's not just you know just the mechanical it's also the taste is there the flavor is wrong we see that shakespeare we see that hamlet didn't have i mean shakespeare didn't have it complete and he was wrong in these areas you know and some things are you know are bad and uh, you know we got we got to take the gold out of the you know, mm. out of the excrement you know yeah yeah yes. yeah yeah that's nice so uh con- continuing this point of world classical literature just maybe two questions i had about shakespeare so one is many of his almost many of his most celebrated mm, plays are tragedies yeah is there, yeah is there a yeah. reason for that yeah. or i mean of course you could say the world is dukkhalaya and he's doing <laughs> that but uh, it it does seem that all of his major stories not all but all of his major ones they seem to end in on a very tragic note well um yeah we have romeo and juliet uh hamlet king lear king also. lear and uh, macbeth uh the taming of the shrew is a is a comedy yeah yeah and if i can think of any more you know okay. uh, i think also uh, as you like it is also a comedy and what's the one ah uh, the tempest yeah 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 um do you know anything about science fiction tradition science fiction movies of course uh, you know star wars <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yes of course i do i, yeah. I do have, i know a few things okay uh, I saw one time on I was looking at the YouTube it had the, maybe the 20 20 greatest science fiction movies because you're looking at looking at traditions you know and they're going through this movie and that movie and for different reasons they're coming up and they come up to uh 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 number 1 and the guy says before before he says he says okay before I I've uh, tell you what the number one you know the greatest science fiction movie of all time was he says I don't even have to say it you all know what it is in every single category we've listed before the quality of direction everything else you all know it is this is it wins it's at 2001 space odyssey space odyssey yeah like who that uber even now you know it's it's incredible it's incredible you know um and it deals with very, very ontological questions too you know but the, mm. the most original first what people would call i think the first real science fiction movie where it has some real you know special effects and everything else and i remember watching this as a little child my parents took me there it was uh what was it what, what was it called it was called forbidden planet forbidden oh. planet with robby robby the robot and all this kind of stuff and it was so exciting they fly to some planets you know where the scientists got all lost the, many years before and the young girls there with this and that and the monsters there with this and that 
And it's very good. It's a very, very good movie. Even now, I tell you the story would be like, oh my. So Paul D said, hey, that's a fantastic storyline and all the imagery and the relationships with the king and all this kind of stuff, you know. And you're looking at them and you said, don't you recognize it? So what do you mean? It's the Tempest. <laughs> oh, an island, not a planet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's the Tempest. But I just put, it all, put everybody with ray guns rather than bows and arrows. And, <laughs> it makes it a little bit sure. And, you know, yeah. And had a science fiction monster rather than a, you know, yeah. So it, it's the, the Tempest is, I think, I still think a cut. I don't know. I guess it's the point. I don't know why some. I, 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 yeah. So, yeah. I guess in the Bhagavatam, most of the stories, comedies or or, or, or tragedies. Comedies. Yeah. I think Comedy means the, means the way Indra, Indra Indra acts sometimes, and then he is he makes a fool of himself. Is it, but the uh, word comedy is his te technical word. Comedy means where it starts out against the protagonist and ends up for him. A tragedy means where it starts out for the protagonist ends up against him. So it's a technical thing. It doesn't mean it's funny. In classical language, it doesn't mean it's funny. Oh, the comedy okay. means where it comes out uh, comes out good. You know, the protagonist doesn't end up dead with his wife, fiance, wife dead and everybody else dead. You know, you know everybody kind of takes arms and is happy and so on. The Bhagavatam, I think, usually comes out with a, a positive ending in many cases. You know, but yeah, not least, always. Just, yeah. Yeah. At least a spiritually nice. positive ending, because there is a clear description of the spiritual yeah. world. So in that yeah. sense, all the endings are spiritually positive. Materially, like Sudama is materially positive. Sudama's yeah. story, Dhruva's story, some of yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know why Shakespeare, the, the I don't know. He, he, he was, I think he died, died prematurely because of, I got, got too drunk one night and got a fever. That appears to be what happened. He and Ben Johnson overdid it a little bit. And, and then they got really sick and then they caught some fever going around. So he died pretty young, 50 years old. So it may have been, you know, he may have been a, you know, what do you call it? Depressive, has some depressive personality. And also to the ambience in England at that time, where it was, you know, good reason to be dep depressed about things, you know? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so the tragedy, okay, it's a tragedy, but yeah, we get something out of it. So people, yeah, definitely. you know, yeah, life is tra life is tragedy, but we're learning. Mm. Yes, fine. Wow. Like there is a there's a, there's a, some contemporary thinkers who talk about the tragic view of the world or tragic view of life, where yeah. basically life mm. is unfair, like <laughs> resources, yeah. resources are not distributed equally, <laughs> and we many of the unfairness of life we just can't. No matter how much we do, we can't rectify them. We have to live with yeah, them. Yeah. So in yeah. some ways, that. Uh, like you said, acceptance of destiny, acceptance of distress in life, that is also depicted through Shakespeare. And that mm -hmm. also is a theme which our, our Mahabharata Ramayana talk about it. There's a lot of distress and something just come without, uh, without we being able to do anything about it, no matter how yeah. much we try. Yeah. And also to my purposes, the Maya body is focused on the negative aspect of the material world. And, and, and we focus on the positive aspect. Yeah. But we have to have both. The Sahajiya is focused on the positive aspect. The Maya body is focused on the negative aspect of spirituality. Okay. So Yusupanishad says you've got to cultivate both. Understand the negative aspects and understand the positive aspects. But we tend to focus on the positive aspects. That's our idea. You know, enthusiasm is more important than patience. Yeah. Yeah. But, but so, yeah, that's, there's some, uh, the, the Maya body philosophers, Brit, Britra Hari. That okay. Maya body Brahma, yeah, he's, he's by, was it Bairagya Shataka or whatever it is? Yeah, that's true. I mean, he's, I don't think there's anybody in the face of the earth who's ever, you know, bad mouth material nature better, better than him. <laughs> A bad mouth like, you know, material nature. It's like, yeah, you know, and so, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, that's, I think, I think all, all of, even, for example, boy, all of, all of these things, I'm trying to think now that Shakespeare's plays, this is why it's nice. But I think there's a, there's a positive, Romeo and Juliet, they both die and her, her brother dies. This is the whole thing of Gandhari, was it Gandhari and, uh, was it Gandhari? Uh, Gandhari? No, was it? Uh, yeah, it's Gand Dhritarashtra's wife, Gand Gandhari. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I think it's her, 
No, Rukmini, Rukmini, Rukmini. The kidnap of Rukmini and, and Romeo, Romeo and Juliet and uh, Rukmini and, <laughs> and and Krishna, you know. Is it interesting? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The icons. But but in, when Romeo and Juliet, when everybody's dead, and the two families who were engaged in a civil war for for so long, they they having the, 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 the counts the count comes in uh, for county and chastises both of them, these two families, and said, just see what this this war has done, this civil war, your pride has done, it's destroyed the uh, your most beloved children, now they're dead because of what you've done. You know? So uh, the, the drama, they look at each other and they go in, into the funeral thing and instead of you know, being hating each other, they look at each other and they, they the, the two leaders, they grasp arms and they go in holding arms like that. Okay, we, we've, we, we see that God's gonna teach us a lesson that we have to give up this feud and this hate. Mm. And, and so that's the thing I think in all, all of Shakespeare's tragedies, there's a tremendous amount of, 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 of lesson going on. And what is right and what is wrong and, and, and deeper values, deeper values. Oh boy, uh, what is it? Uh, Lady Macbeth, oh, that's just full of stuff, you know. I mean, you know, uh, Vitarastra, I mean, uh, Macbeth. You know, Macbeth, he has, in the end, he has to, you know, his wife goes nuts and leaves him holding the bag for the entire thing. She, she gets out of, she caused the whole problem of murdering his friend. Yeah. And then she she escapes by going going crazy, so now nobody, nobody can get you know, get after her. His his best friend is leading an army against him. The, the omens of, the gods have turned against him. The Burnham Wood has come to Dunsinor, you know. So the very very famous thing he's sitting there and seeing all his whole world just collapse like like Vitarastra. So here's a per, here's a perfect mm-hmm. example of you know of uh, of Dhritarashtra, you know, and and uh, what's his name? Uh, King King Lear, uh, Lear. Uh, King Lear, yeah. Macbeth, Macbeth, you know. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, right. Sitting there in his room alone at night, the battle's going to happen the next day, and a candle's burning, and uh, he says, uh, "He said, life is a tale told by by a poor player, poor actor, who fruts and struts his hour upon the stage and then is gone, who is who is heard no more." Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, you know, signifying nothing. Out, out, brief candle, you know. Uh, wind blow, storm crack. At least we'll die with armor on our back. <laughs> so this is a you know, perfect example of a dira, no? It's dira, you know. All this stuff has happened, Vitarastra, everything else, and he becomes dira, right? <laughs> He just turns his back on everything and walks out and faces the enemy and faces his death. Baba says, like a good soldier. Mm. And so this soliloquy is so famous. You know, wind blows, storm crack. All this stuff happening. At least we'll die with armor on our back. Yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> so even in the but that's Jira. He, he didn't. He didn't achieve Naratam. He didn't achieve Vaishnavism. Yeah. 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 In, in one sense. So it's not not just tragedy, but it's how how the character how the characters evolve in the face of the tragedy. Yes. So, yeah. I think even yeah. Hamlet does that in the last play. Hamlet is quite, uh, yeah. in one sense, stoic and resigned, precise and everything. But later on, yeah. he is uh, the most of the play. He's quite mad, and he's almost yeah. seems incoherent. But towards yeah. the end, what he speaks and how he acts is quite like you said, Dira. So lucid, lucid, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So- I think Dira, like you're saying, Dira is a big theme in Shakespeare, but for some people, that's all they can do. You know, that's all they can accomplish. Vitarastra, even, even though he had Vidura for a guru, he could not come beyond the level of, 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 of Dira. You know? yeah. mm. But but he was able to achieve that. Okay, that's you know, okay. You know. So Buddha was giving stuff much beyond the contemporary atmosphere. Shankar was giving stuff much beyond the contemporary atmosphere, but only a few people were able to take it. So what we're able to give on the broad, you know, global basis, you know, you know, what will that be? You know, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. How are you com- connecting Shankar and Buddha with? Are you connecting with Shakespeare or are you connecting? No, because with uh, Buddha, to, Buddha is a famous story about the bamboo leaves in the forest. Yeah, yeah. That he, I, I can teach you many things, but I'm only going to teach you a few. 
but don't yes. think that that's all. Same way, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, Muramate. Shankara is attributed with saying these things. But is there wasn't what it was what, what that. So how much are we? How much you know? We have to adjust. Maybe we end up doing a lot of level to people. We'll be put in a position where our responsibility reach to people to Dira, you know, to oh, to okay. you know, Nitegor Sundar Das. He's uh, Sundar Das. He was recently in He's my he's our institute. He's my we have a, a nonprofit educational corporation, Neos. You can go to our webpage, Jairama. <laughs> like my webpage here, Jairama.us, my webpage. And neosnimbus.org uh, is our, our ex esoteric organization, Neos. You know? uh, but uh he he works, his job is uh he's head of geriatric psychiatry at the local uh, psychiatric hospital place. So he's dealing with all these people in their lives, you know. And because it's Nashville, the Bible Belt, I would say, when he starts consulting with them and now starting to take their families to this, dealing with his old age problems, senile dementia, he said the first question he asked them, one of them is, do you believe in God? In other places, you can't ask that. But here, because everybody's Christian, everything else is considered quite, quite a bona fide question. And somebody... Even if they don't, they're atheists, so say, well, I don't believe in God. But many people do. Mm -hmm. And that changes a whole lot in terms of the, the geriatric psychiatry and what they're dealing with and stuff and how he's dealing with them, you know, and talking to them. It has to be pretty quick because it's modern medicine, you know. But, but okay, so he can talk about God here and, and facing old age and these kind of things, but he can't talk about ghosts. <laughs> and, uh, and there are... There, there were, a, a, I remember he was telling me when he was a young man here, maybe 30 years ago, coming as his residence, he said so many of his patients were haunted by ghosts, you know, but he couldn't talk about it because they put him in a mental hospital. You know? uh, one of the biggest battles in the entire Civil War was fought here. I mean, I, if you come with me, get in my car, and in and, and, uh, something like seven minutes, I can take you to a graveyard, which will just blah. You know, 10,000 gravestones, one after another, side by side, you know. And they fought it out here, jabbing steel bayonets into each other's stomachs, biting each other's ears off, blowing their heads off. I mean, it was, oh, let it go, fella. No, no they, they, you know, the way people died here, they just, they just couldn't give up the horror. And so then people with mental problems, they would started to, to grab onto their bodies and stuff, you know, to try and, like, sort it out. You know. So, you know. So anyway, there's, yeah. okay. <laughs> there's a, a cosmology and everything else. I would say it's coming through Christian tradition. There was a lot of depression in the time of Shakespeare. It wasn't in a, it wasn't in a nice place. But at the same time, too, there was there's also a, you see a lot of beauty there, too. You know, there's a lot of beauty and appreciation of nature and stuff. You know, and maybe people are you know, dwelling on the tragedies more. But mm. I, I showed uh, the Taming of the Shrew. Do you know the Taming of the Shrew? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay. Do you know who, who the most famous movie presentation of that? Starring two, an actor and an actress. Uh, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor did it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they, they, they say, you know, the, the parts they were, they were born to play. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it was like this. This was like who they were. And they, they fit in there so well. So I, I showed it. And then it, was, it had a Spanish captions in it. Spanish, Spanish over the... So we did it one night and uh, I had to edit, edit it down, you know. But we did it one night in, uh, as a program in Chile. Some of the, the, the audience in the audience here remember that. And, uh, and, and of course, it stimulated such discussion afterwards, you know, because it's such a, it's such a comedy. And it's, at the same time, too, it's full of like, you know, very kind of deep things about what, is, what are men and women, what are their relationships and stuff, you know. And it, it stimulates these discussions. So I, the, the conclusion is in the end, Elizabeth Taylor surrenders and bows down to her husband and honors him in so many ways and accepts his authority, you know? And uh, so I asked in the end, well, what do you, this is a correct conclusion. And some of, some of the girls were like, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not. We, we, I don't think we, we would fully agree with it, but it definitely stimulates this question. And it's a comedy. And the conclusion is, uh, is, is very nice, you know, so let's go on. But, there we have it, and it, it stimulates this whole discussion about Varna Ashram, Daibi Varna Ashram, and these kind of things like that. Yeah, wow. 
Amazing. This is yes. This is, yeah, this is remarkable resourcefulness. You know, I have sometimes used some sections from the Avatar movie to talk about Avatar, or yeah. even the Mat Matrix movie to talk about some mm -hmm. higher things. But this is uh, yeah. The, this is remarkable. You're taking out the shoe and using it to talk about gender roles, and so in one sense. We but you also doing are you also doing the Ramayana, are you doing the Ramayana or the Mahabharata for your morality lessons? Oh, I'm doing both. I'm designing in this yeah. pandemic. <laughs> I'm de I'm designing courses now because not just books yeah. but also make systematic online courses to talk about human yeah. values. You know. Yeah. So you use you you use Indian classics, aren't you? You're using Mahabharata and Ramayana. Yeah, I'm trying to do that, Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, you should doing the same thing, but it's just you know because it's from 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 your 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 culture, your perspective. Hmm. And all, also, too, I'm 72 years old. How are you? How old are you? <laughs> I'm around 45, my Oh, young man, young man. Young <laughs> man. <laughs> said that. Papa said 40, 50, young man. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've been, I've been doing this longer, you know, hmm. and so on. So by the time you, by the time you're 72 years old, if you go on, it's, Prabhupada, Prabhupada is a big rock that hit the water, and when he hit the water and and sunk pass through the water it created a wave but but the waves that are going to come after are even going to be you know going to be bigger even yeah i mean the influencing people like you and me for generations he, you know hans Duda invited Prabhupada to germany he went there and it was a very incredible visit then he asked him to come again and Prabhupada said germans were the materially most intelligent people on the planet you know and then Hans Duda invited him to come again. He said, no, I cannot go there again. There are people there who would kill me, you know? And so I think that the German demons were the only ones maybe who were smart enough to figure out how dangerous Prabhupada really was. You know, this man is not because he's taking some hippies and making them into a movement. This man is disseminating a cultural revolution on a very deep level. And unless we eliminate this man, we're gonna have big problems. So that's what I see is just, you know, myself. I'm just trying to go on and I, I may take birth in our Gurukul system again. So I'm trying to help the Gurukul system because <laughs> I, may, I may read my own books and say, oh, that's, that's a good book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I feel that uh, through this discussion today, you have opened so many horizons about how Krishna consciousness can be made uh, made accessible to people from diverse audiences. And one metaphor which you used in the beginning, it just passed over, but I, like Prabhupada laid many foundations on which yeah. we have not built. So, yeah. you know, some foundations we have worked a lot, like build temples, distribute books, and that's important. But, but uh, you know, Prabhupada also had discussions with, uh, dialogue with many intellectual people, and that was not primarily for converting them in a sense. It is just to to exchange thoughts and gain some, and help them appreciate Krishna consciousness at some level. So, yeah. When, when he has, you know, Toynbee, I, I remember, I think it was, I was listening to his uh, dialogue with Toynbee, you know, mm. Toynbee, Toynbee's conclusion, his father was a gigantic economist. Toynbee's conclusion was that the history of international relations was the history of religion. Uh, Dimitri Katsikas, big professor we were working with, said the same thing. That, the history of inter international relations, which was his job, is a history of religion. You know, different oh. religions go behind it. So, uh, when as I remember the dialogue when Prabhupada was talking with Toynbee, the whole humor was, "My God, I I finally met a man with a brain." <laughs> and Prabhupada was like, because Toynbee was just right on top of all the politics and everything that was happening in India, and he asked something about why Indira Gandhi did this and that, and was it because of this? And Prabhupada was going, "Yes." Exactly. You, yes, that's exactly why she did it. Yeah. And that's the behind the thing. And so, the, again, it's, Prabhupada told Srupa Dhamara Maharaj, he told, Dhamara told me, the Prabhupada told him, every scientist you make a devotee is worth a thousand ordinary people. But my experience is that it takes a thousand times longer to make one scientist into a devotee than it takes you know, to get ordinary people to become devotees and get involved in everything else, you know. They, they, scientists, many times, slow to come and slow to leave. When they're convinced, they're convinced on a really, on a Gyan level, and that's hard to shake. 
if you're convinced on a karma level, oh, I like the rituals, I like the food, I like this, I like that, and some of the philosophy, you can be, you know, shaken, you know, and maybe out of a thousand people converted like that, one of them will become, you know, so it's just have your choice, you know, convince one side I'm a devotee or convince a thousand ordinary people to become devotees. Because the same amount of time and the same blood will have to be given to do it, you know. That's an amazing thought. Somebody yeah. else may want to convince Vaisha to become a devotee. <laughs> Henry Ford, you know, his name, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And that's an amazing thought, actually. Intellectually oriented people do take time. They oh, don't yeah. they don't they don't immediately accept the party line or they don't accept uh, they don't accept yeah. easy answers to questions. So you know it it I have seen I've seen in India and no criticism, India our preaching is flourishing a lot. And we, I can say that we are attracting intelligent young people, but not so many intellectual young people. That uh, means intelligent, uh -huh. they are in they are engineering colleges <laughs> and they are, they are in the STEM fields. So they are very intelligent, yeah. but they are not really lit, they are not really philosophically oriented, thinking about the big big questions of life or even the big issues of life. So they become devotees very easily. But right now, for example, I am one of the editors for Back to Godhead. So we always run short of uh, articles because there are not so many devotees who are yeah. really good writers. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think that... Uh, there, there was one uh, in, indigenous um, person, Ishi. It's a very famous thing. He was... Because when the, you know, when the Northern Europeans came to California, so many of the tribes were killed either by diseases or you know, starvation or they just merged in. And one whole tribe was just basically... Some were actually killed, you know. For certain reasons and the conflict of the economic and everything else um so uh but ishi, ishi was the last guy of one whole tribe that had been destroyed I maybe mean, not so many people they just all died out everything else and he was just hiding out with his uh mother and one woman who was like a wasn't his sister anybody else and he and when finally when they died you know he just kind of just came out out and one a cultural anthropologist at the University of California adopted him and got him a job as an assistant janitor because he refused to accept charity. And so they became assistant janitor and he worked there and that. Then he would interview him and his whole series of lectures on how what culture was before the European culture came. And he took him places and you can see the nostalgia was actually hurting him, so he didn't stay long. But he was showing him where things had gone. He showed him how to start a fire with a, you know, just with the bow and the stick and how to hunt and everything else. And he was you know, but you can see it was just too painful. So they, they did something. So many things. And in the end, and after all this, he he was realizing that they had their own view of the world. And he actually began to realize how Ishi was looking at Europeans. And it's the same same thing that Carl Jung got. Um, he said that they are like, his view was, they are like children, clever, but not wise. Beautiful. Yeah. So you become very clever with all these engineering abilities and everything else, but not wise. Yeah. Ooh, that's a, that's a bad one. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. You know, Bhakti Tell Thakur some engineering also, guy that. Yeah, yeah. You know, Bhakti Unar Thakur also had a, yeah. he made a comparison that irked some of his more <laughs> nationalistic colleagues. He said that the Western people, say like if there is a father, who has two children, so two sons, yeah. and one of them is uh, more, more evolved, more spiritually oriented, and the other is more interested in finances, management. So both of them can work together. Let the younger brother take care yes. of the finances and let the older brother yes. pursue spiritual pursuits and share spiritual wisdom. So he envisioned yes. that to be like the British and the Indians. So he said that we are all descended from the same stock. And let the British manage the country. We will share spiritual wisdom. So yeah, yeah, that's very similar. Wow, wow, wow. We're seeing we're seeing the same truth everywhere. <laughs> yes, wow, yeah. that's amazing. Which means that we can we, we can we can apply the same we can apply the same medicine. Then we should start to see these principles. We know, okay, this is you know this is the problem. You know, okay. And we can identify all these people who are graduating from the universities are not universal men, they're technicians. You know? mm -hmm. Starting to turn out technicians rather than you know universalists. You know? Yeah. True. Yeah. It's but uh, um maybe it's uh it's maybe we should 
take a pause here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Usually two, two hours. Toward, yeah. yeah, thank you, Anish. Toward the end, I try to summarize. Of course, we had a very wide-ranging discussion. But can I try to summarize briefly what we discussed? You, okay. you can try. You can try. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Wow. So, today we discussed on the broad theme of uh, seeing Western classical literature and specifically Shakespeare from a spiritual or a Krishna conscious perspective. And then you started, we started by discussing that there are like Prabhupada himself, you give many insights about Prabhupada, which you don't know, like Prabhupada gave a talk on Merchant of Venice and Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada uh, talked about how there is this, the universal iconography, which catches, which connects with the, with the heart at the deeper level beyond the brain. And if we can speak, so why do we, why, why at all we study Shakespeare? Just like, Yukta Vairagya means we can use technology and other things in Krishna's service. So even books, some people study books, they live with books and books, ideas, worldviews, they can also be used in Krishna's service. So broadly two ways. One is that if they're already familiar with those books and then we build bridges by which the knowledge which we are sharing becomes accessible. And another point is that because these books also talk about universal themes, so they can yeah. even guide us. It's not just yeah. sharing spiritual wisdom, but just the human journey can be guided. Like you mentioned how at the time when devotees were suddenly asked to take second initiation, you compare that with the Hamlet scene of Gertrude suddenly mm -hmm. marrying again. So, yeah. so both. Of, so the, then we talked about the universal, the universal themes, like there is the betrayal and uh, uncle betraying uh, nephews and mm -hmm. things like that. So they are very common. And then we also talked about the philosophy of the ontology. So some case, so the cases of, say, for example, <clears throat> praying as repentance and thinking that I cannot get forgiveness if I'm still holding on. And mm -hmm. that, that Claudia is saying that. And then especially very striking was uh, Hamlet saying that I, I don't want to kill him right now because he will go to heaven. Yam yam mapis paran bhavam. So those are very remarkable correlations. So it's both ways, not just universal themes, but they're also specific, not only universal human challenges, but also specific philosophical themes. The yeah. idea of existence beyond death, the idea of ghosts, the existence of, as you said, uh, destiny, a divine end yeah. shaping yeah. human, a divine, divine plan shaping human ends. So uh -huh. all these are, and then we, uh, all these are very strikingly similar to the Vedic teachings. Gita's teachings. And then there's a source mentioned that in the Christian tradition, there is not much philosophy, but they often draw a lot of philosophy from the Greek or Roman worldview. Yeah. And that's yeah. how now uh, Shakespeare was at a time, you know, Cervantes and Shakespeare, the remarkable correlation you showed. And yeah. so the idea is that that it was a that the ambience was such that there was uh, at one level a lot of strife. And lot was going on at that time. It was a religiously surcharged and religiously, polar, religiously polarized place. But at the same time, from there, he is not only drawing from Roman themes, like say Julius ah. Caesar, but he's also like explicit stories. But he's also bringing in that wisdom and sharing it. And then we talked about how Shri Prabhupad, like two three different metaphors which I found very striking. But this one is that Prabhupad laid foundations for many things which. He wanted us, which he wanted us to build on. So just yeah. like, like regard for intellectual engagement, you give the examples of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you know, studying Advaita Vat to accept initiation. He at least knew about Advaita Vat to take initiation there. Jiva Goswami studied Mimamsa in the Sandar and other schools of thought in Sandarbhas. Bhakti Vinod Thakur also that he engaged with other religious traditions. Mm -hmm. So he said that you know we can draw some things from them. We respect them. And you also mentioned, I never thought of it that way from the perspective of Yukta Vairagya, that when the gopis worship Katyayani, they are showing that even other forms of worship can be used in Krishna's service. So the, the scope of Yukta Vairagya is very huge. And for generally, there is some reservation for this kind of engagement with books and ideas. The one reason is because most devotees are not so much into, most people in general are not into reading books and things. So yeah. Books, so if they are anyway going to read limited, then better focus on, on direct yeah. scriptures. But those who have an avid interest in books, instead of once they are grounded in Prabhupada's teachings, they said that then we can, if we are connected with Prabhupada, then we can actually 
bring connections and bridges with various other people you give the example of socrates phedo that how well read people you may they, they may think that you no know, you say your tradition is the greatest but yeah. have you have you read other traditions how do the can you bring about correlations between them yeah, that, yeah, will, yeah. that will help yeah. them gain appreciation and for yeah. this so one side is for such outreach uh, we will need some not everybody can do it those who are already interested in reading and those who are that that orientation and then the outreach also will be little more refined in the sense that we may have not have th- thousands of people becoming devotees but their consciousness will rise and that itself like you mentioned yeah. how uh, what shankaracharya and buddha taught was way more than what the people at that time got from them so we also have to see wh- how much we can wh- wh- from what we teach how much people get and uh, in that connection when we present that was a very striking point which uh, that one scientist is equal to 1000 devotees ordinary devotees 1000 1000 ordinary people ordinary people yeah so i mean yeah. but to make a scientist into a devotee we may require 1000 yeah. 1000 yeah. uh, <laughs> times more effort and uh, that is you quote about the american native american saying that these westerners were clever but not wise so like that we are we may be getting technicians but we are not really getting thinkers so oh. if we expand our uh, if we expand our ambit of what we can how we can serve krishna so then there are so many more avenues so you talk specifically about four areas you are working on world classical literature science in the vedas then uh, then interfaith and then the bhaktivant library so yeah. these are i feel these are very far reaching endeavors and uh, i know there are many other points but i think uh, We, I tried to summarize as much as I could. You want to add something in conclusion, Maharaj? No, I'm just amazed that you could remember everything. <laughs> Pat, past fifty years old, your short-term memory starts to fall apart. So I have, I can remember. That was one thing I was going to say when you said, "If I am, a, I am at the age of seventy. If I have been a one tenth of your energy or your clarity, I would consider myself extremely fortunate and blessed." It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Also, we have uh, some of our our followers. We have uh, had we had two uni- two university professors here on board, and cinematographers, and and uh, we call it uh, graphic artists, and so many uh, nice people also listening in our, in our our audience right now. And it's been a very motivation for me to have other people as uh, here with us, you know, and you know, being able to give an impetus to talk, you know, thinking, oh, these are the kind of people who can understand this, and that kind of stuff so thank you very much for being able to participate here thank you very much maharaj for sparing your time and sharing your wisdom and look forward to having some you know sometime again in future to have further discussions maybe on kal ah. yang maybe on kal yang we can go deeper sometime okay wow okay okay thank you very much hari krishna hari krishna humble obeisances